sleep two hours, wake up and cry. I'd like to also say a couple of words about uh, Governor Mitch Daniels. He's a great American. He also, like me, was not did not win any popularity contests uh, in his time of service uh, in the government of the United States of America because he insisted on balanced budgets. He insisted on cutting out wasteful spending. He insisted on careful stewardship of the American taxpayers' dollar. The same thing he has done here as governor of the great state of Indiana. And I thank you, Mitch, for it everything that, that you have done. And by the way, I don't know if you ever heard the story about the two inmates in the state prison in the chow line, and one of them turned to the other and said, the food was a lot better in here when you were governor. But I don't know if that's, uh, that's not a very... Uh, there, there are some states you can't tell that joke in, by, uh, by the way. Steve Carter, thank you for your stewardship. I'd like to thank Steve for many things, but I would also like to thank him for his leadership and his effort in trying to uh, beat back and destroy this terrible threat to the American family, and that's called Internet child pornography. I thank you for your leadership on behalf of the American family, Steve, and your, and your leadership in this country. Jeff, Jeff Smolin, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Scott Enright, and also Scott Dorsey, the uh, CEO, as you all know, uh, of Exact Target. Thank you. Actually, uh, Scott has asked me to announce that you're doing so well, everybody gets a pay raise today. So, so I think. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. And Bob Compton, thank you for all that you do for America. So I'm, I'm very happy that you are all here. First, I'd like to mention to you um, that, the, as you, I'm sure you know, that uh, the American embassy was assaulted uh, yesterday, that uh, there, parts of it were burned, and there's been riots and demonstrations. Um, there's a... There's a problem, as you know, in that part of the world for centuries. It's where the uh, Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire collided uh, with the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there's been tensions in that part of the world for many, many years. And they, the empire that once was called the uh, Austro-Hungarian, I'm not going to give you a long history lesson, was a conglomeration of different ethnic groups and different different faiths and different religions and after World War II it was held together by Tito who was basically a dictator sometimes benign but was a dictator and now Kosovo's independence is now the seventh nation that used to be what we called Yugoslavia and as you know they are ethnic Albanians and as I'm sure you know they were very badly mistreated under Milosevic and uh, we went to Kosovo to we had, and other nations went to Kosovo to try to stop what was basically taking place there, which was ethnic cleansing of Muslims. And we stopped it, and so now Kosovo has uh, declared its independence. Um, obviously, the Serbs didn't want that to happen. I believe that the people that orchestrated most of those riots and demonstrations were young people who probably had... Uh, been exploited by this ultra-nationalist movement that's still the old supporters of Milosevic. I think uh, the reports are there was a great deal of alcohol consumed and a lot of these young people were just hoodlums. But it still is always disturbing when uh, a United States Embassy is attacked. Obviously at least one person is killed and others uh, injured. Uh, I think it's going to calm down. I think it's going to be um, uh, the, the, the fact of Kosovo independence will be accepted over time as a fact. But I also worry when I see the Russians uh, trying to exploit these divisions and I see the Russians uh, basically threatening uh, the country of Georgia. There's a, quote, breakaway republic there, and I won't bother, or two of them actually, but I won't bother you with that. But I think this is going to pass, but I continue to worry about the Russian and Mr. Putin's continued sort of efforts to block progress and not be helpful 
in trying to bring about a peaceful resolution of these issues. And I won't go on too long about Russia and Putin, but it's clear that he has placed himself in power for as long as he wants to remain in power. A protege of his will be the, quote, new president, and he will already assume new and additional powers as the prime minister. And it's disturbing when the Russians are not helpful to us when we're talking about Iranians building nuclear weapons. It's disturbing when the Russians continue to block uh, serious action, the Russians and the Chinese, as far as Darfur is concerned, and North Korea. And I don't think we're going to see a reignition of the Cold War. I don't think Russia has that capability. But it is, it is clear that Mr. Putin has... Um, engaged in rather populist slash nationalist slash anti-American uh, behavior and uh, it's not in the interests of world peace. Senator Joe Lieberman and I uh, proposed some time ago that he should be, that Russia should be excluded from the G8 uh, meetings um, because those are countries that share common values and common ideals and common principles. And if it were not for the price of oil, the Russian economy would not be in any kind of, of decent shape, which argues, my dear friends, for independence from foreign oil. I'm sure you know that the price of oil a couple of days ago went up over $100 a barrel. What that means is the United States of America will be sending $400 billion a year, half of our trade deficit, to countries that don't like us very much including the fact that, the, or that some of that money will end up in the hands of terrorist organizations. My friends, we have to, we must establish as our national priority independence of foreign oil. We must do that. We can do it. And the, entre and the entrepreneurship and, uh, the, uh, and the innovation that we see right here, right here, with exact target is uh, what we can employ. My friends, green technologies are not only good for America, they're good for our economy. We embrace these green technologies, whether it be wind, solar, uh, nuclear, whatever it is, and uh, we can save energy. The world's largest corporation, General Electric, has announced years ago that they are committed to green technologies. And by the way, nuclear power is one of those. And I recognize there's controversy associated with nuclear power. My friends, it is safe and it is clean and it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, I, I, and by the way, in case you missed it, the French, we always like to imitate the French. 80% 80 of their electricity is generated by nuclear power. And by the way, in case you missed it, we now have uh, a pro-American president of France which shows if you live long enough, anything can happen <laughs> in the world. <laughs> as you know. So, um, by the way, we've sailed Navy ships around the world for more than 60 years with nuclear power plants on them and we've never had an accident. So that's, that's got to be part of it. But so we've got a nexus of really two national overwhelming priorities. One is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because we want to hand our children a cleaner planet. And I think that the debate should go on, but I think the fact is that, uh, that climate change, I, on a day like today, I hesitate to use the words global warming, uh, but uh, that climate change is real, and we can, using American technology and innovation, uh, develop the kinds of technologies which will reduce it. And also, this dependence on foreign oil is a national security issue, as you know. As president, I will try to explain as clearly and compelling as po manner as possible how important these two issues, the nexus of them, is. 